Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the stage, Leslie Berland. So, I've heard that it's really challenging to find women leaders in tech. <laughs> well, my friends, here we are. I've also heard it's impossible to fill a room for an all-women event. Look around, everyone. Here we are. Time and time again, I've heard that it's really difficult to find women of color leading in tech. Here we are. We're here at CES to talk about women in tech, and the headline is, we've got a ways to go. But this issue is bigger than CES, and it's bigger than tech. It's bigger than all of us in this room and in this country. This is a rallying cry in support of amazing women across industries and sectors around the world. Women just starting out in their careers and women climbing their way up. This event is even in support of women who have made their way to the top. Because over the past year and the last few weeks alone, it is clear that as women, we still need to raise our hands and say, here we are. Today, we're not doing a typical panel. Each of our speakers will get the solo spotlight she deserves. Each will share her story, her insights, and her advice. And we'll open up to your questions. Before I hand over the mic, I'd like to humbly share my one piece of advice. And it's focus, focused on what brought us here in the first place. It speaks to every person in this industry and beyond who has the ability to make a decision or influence one. The decision about who stands on stages, who makes the list, who appears on magazine covers, who attends the events. With each action and every decision we make, we are telling a story, we are shaping a narrative, and we are delivering a message. Often when I see a stage or a magazine cover dominated by men or by women who look the same, I reach out to the decision maker and the responses are remarkably the same. Well, Leslie, our process has always been X. The format has always been Y. We tried, but we've always done it this way. So my advice is quite simply, change the rules. <laughs> change the rules for how it's done. <laughs> Break through the rigidity of ways past and rewrite the guidelines that are holding us back. We must redefine a new way forward. It's our responsibility and we are accountable. Let us get creative. I promise the outcome will be stronger and more powerful than where you started. And the impact will be larger than what you ever imagined. So let's not fear change, let's embrace it. Let's put women leaders of today and tomorrow front and center where they belong, where they can shine, where they can teach, and where they can inspire. This is the only way we will move our industries and the world forward. So with that, I introduce our first speaker, the ultimate rule changer <laughs> and game changer, co-founder and executive editor of Recode and all things badass, <laughs> Kara Swisher. Can you leave it? Can you leave it? Can you leave it? I like you want to keep it? I like a podium. I like to I like to avoid some intimacy with the crowd. Um, where's Donald Trump? <laughs> He's in the back attacking the media. Um, you know, I only joke about that, but I cannot believe we have to fucking do this, people. Like, that we have to talk about women in tech. A couple years ago at CES, if you recall, there was the pink zone for women. If you remember, it was all gadgets in pink because women couldn't touch gadgets that were not that color. And here we are again with their lame excuses of why they don't have women on stage at CES. So I, I'm, I'm going to say fuck them, but fuck them. Um, so I think we should all just chant for a minute just to calm, calm myself down. Okay, one, two, three, Oprah. <laughs> All right, let's begin. That's my title. Oh, they changed it. It was Queen of All She Surveys. <laughs> Jesus. It's probably a man who did that. 
I have two sons. It's going to go off. They also did this to it. Okay, that's my whole story. I was born someday, not hopefully today, on the flight back on a tiny plane. I will die. That is pretty much all I need to know about anything I do in my life. Um, I think we all sit around and act like we're going to live forever. My dad died when I was five. People don't realize that. Uh, I've talked about it somewhat, a little bit, a lot, but it's been with me my whole life, the concept of mortality and how we are here just for a short time uh, on this planet. Whenever I feel like uh, I can't do something, whenever I feel insecure, which is almost never, um, <laughs> Actually, never. Um, this is what I think about. It's sort of like the Steve Jobs speech, which you should, I urge you all to go look at, is you were born, you will be dead. In 50 to 60 years, you will not be here. Uh, so anything I do, I always think, uh, whenever I'm uh, worried about something or whether I'm nervous about doing something, I think I will die. And it actually comes from, I come from an Italian family, it comes from my grandmother who when I was, I was always, I'm always really busy and I'm always doing things and, and stuff like that. And she lived up in Scranton, Pennsylvania. And she would always say, whenever I said, I'm really busy, I'll get there as soon as I can, Grandma. And she said, you know, the graveyards are full of busy people. Um, which I, I know, right? An old crazy Italian grandmother doing that really does sort of <laughs> clarify things for you. So this is my story, my entire story. I'm not going to tell any more of it, but that is, that is it. That is the sum total of it so that you can understand. I have a longer story, but I only have eight minutes, so I can't really tell you all my fantastic adventures. Second part. This is my advice. They're asking us to do certain things in these templates. I do, I'm not often... Um, <laughs> I'm not often, I don't quote Dr. Seuss that much. He, he irritates me on many levels. But this is a very good quote. Uh, this is essentially saying, you know, it's be who you are, say what you feel, because no matter, uh, those, whatever, you can read. Um, what this is the sum total of my advice for most women and, and my children, my two sons too, um, is uh, be genuine. I think one of the things that women tend not to do is be the people they are. Um, they tend to, they, they t people talk a lot about transparency, but as long as you hide yourself. Um, and I think one of the things that's, uh, that is, that the message that are given to women especially uh, are to hide yourself, hide your true nature, hide who you are, hide what you look like. As people also know about me, I happen to be gay. Um, it's, it's an easy thing to hide and it's an easy thing to feel shame about and I, I'm, I, even though I look Fantastic. Um, I, am quite, I am quite old, and I grew up in an era uh, where this was a problem. And I, throughout my life, I had, had to deal with this kind of thing. And so one of the things I learned is if you aren't genuine and honest to yourself and publicly, you tend not to be successful. Um, and so I always think about this. Uh, anyone who I notice that I cover, and I've covered every person uh, who's, who's on the internet, all the leaders of the internet, and pretty much if I had to take one thing that they're all like is they're genuine to themselves. Um, even if they're weird, even if they're difficult, even if they're obnoxious, they are exactly who the people they are and they express themselves that way. And pretty much every successful person I know is like that. Um, even, even at the price of certain things when you do it. And so that is my one piece of advice. Um, and now I'm going to tell three stories um, to, to illustrate this, this very point um, of which, uh, which I think is the most important thing I, I operate on. I love her. I love Gail Goodell so much. <laughs> it's, it's so painful. Uh, uh, stab them in the front. All right, I'll explain why this is. I'm going to tell a very, very quick story. Where's the timer? I'll just keep talking. Um, OK, there. But no, there's no timer. Oh, great. Seven seconds. What? All right. OK, all right. Um, I, uh, I started off my career in Washington, D.C. I was working for a man named John McLaughlin. He had a TV show called The McLaughlin Group. He was the beginning of screamy cable television. Um, he sexually harassed people uh, very badly. He was the old kind of sexual harasser. He'd chase people around the desk, the old, old timey sexual harasser. Um, <laughs> and I testified against him in a trial against him. Years later, uh, he, he was, he was, there was a trial. Someone sued him. I was a witness to his sexual harassment. He was bothering one of the women in the office. Um, and he paid her off like he does, signed the non-disclosure agreements, and went on to be equally successful as is happening today. I, um, I decided, because I was furious about this, and I was 23, 22 at the time, to talk to the Washington Post in a story about, uh, about what he did. Um, and nobody would talk on the record. And so when the reporter came to me, they said, will you talk on the record? You know, you, you can talk off the record. I go, no, no, please use my name. 
Um, because one of the things I thought about was that if your name is not attached to it, the story doesn't count. Um, and people don't believe it. And they still don't believe it when you have your name on it. Um, I, uh, I did that, and I ran into him at a party uh, not long afterwards. And he came up to me, and he said, Kara Swisher, everybody in Washington stabs you in the back, but you stabbed me in the front. Thank you. And I said, any time, you son of a bitch. <laughs> stabbed him in the front. Very quickly. Next slide. Nobody puts baby in the corner. Another fantastic movie, except he's taking her out of the corner. Fuck him. She should just get out of the corner without him. <laughs> That's another thing. I went back to work at the Wall Street Journal after I had my son. Um, I was actually pregnant, if you can imagine that. Um, I, uh, I went back. I had broken all the stories about the internet. This is pre-Twitter. This is Yahoo, Amazon, and stuff like that. I was the lead internet reporter for the Wall Street Journal. I was the only one. I started the internet beat at the Wall Street Journal. I sat down with one of the major editors of the Wall Street Journal, and he said to me, after I I had done such an amazing job. And he said, so, you'll need more time now. And I said, for what? And he goes, uh, I go, it's not because I have a baby, right? <laughs> and he goes, uh, and I said, because that would be illegal. <laughs> I don't need more time. Anyway, nobody puts baby in the corner. I'm doing this very fast. Third one, turn around and face the strange. I love this guy too, sad he died. Uh, he was kind of a lady man, right? You know, he's fantastic, <laughs> he's a fantastic star. Um, one of the things that I think is really important in my career, and everyone's like, how did I change so fast? How did I shift? So one of the things that's critically important is changing almost persistently as you go through your career and not being afraid of it. Women particularly are very afraid of what they're gonna lose. I literally was just talking to a 22 year old and they're like, if I make this move now, I don't know what'll happen. And I'm like, you're 22, stop it. <laughs> I'm like 612 and I'm thinking of doing a new thing, which I am, which will be announced this week. Um, you've got to turn around every point in your career, any time when I felt dissatisfied, when I wasn't pleasing myself, when I wasn't, uh, when I wasn't selfish, uh, I was not successful. Anytime I thought about what pleased me, it created great opportunity for me and everybody else. I think it's critically important to embrace the strangeness that you have. I happen to be super obnoxious, somewhat funny, um, really irritating, and I've used it to work for me for a successful career and a lot of money. So I think you really have to take whatever, as I said, your genuine nature is and, and take that and run with it. Um, because if you don't do that, um, you will, you will, you will get yourself sick. And it's really critically important in, to be a successful person, to be the person you are, again, no matter the price it is. But there isn't a price once you do that. Last, last thing, one of the things I'm really known for at, uh, at, at Recode and throughout my career is always telling the truth and trying, to be, trying really hard to say when something's <laughs> awful. Um, when everyone's celebrating something, I'm always like, oh, no, 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 no. That's not what it's like. And this is not what's happening. It's a critical tenant of Recode, it's a critical tenant of the journalism we do at Recode and all the other places uh, I've, I, I've worked. Um, this is a, a, a quote from a wonderful poet I recommend her, Louise Gluck, um, and it's called Circe's Power. It's about Circe, who, you can read the Odyssey. Um, <laughs> it, you should, it's, it's real long. Um, it's an Odyssey. Um, this is a quote from her poem, and this is Circe speaking. I never turned anyone into a pig. Some people are pigs. I make them look like pigs. Um, one of the things we do at Recode when people say I'm mean or I'm unfair, I'm, show, I'm not, I didn't draw you, I didn't create you, I'm saying what you are. And I think that's one of the things we have to do, especially in this time of, you know, in this current environment. Um, we have to start saying when pigs are pigs and we should just say pigs. Uh, we should say what people are, we should say what they're doing, we should say it out loud and we should have our names attached to it. It's critically important. Um, to not fall victim to that, we shouldn't talk like that, we should be careful and things. When a pig's a pig, say it's a pig. And that's one of the things that I think is really important. And whenever people call me mean, I'm like, I didn't make you. I'm just saying, I'm just calling it as I see it. So when you see something, say something. It's really important um, in your life, in your career. Um, I think that's all the time I have. Leslie? Yes. Next. <laughs> Kara Swisher. So next up, next up, a true tech trailblazer who has been gracing CES stages and many others throughout her entire career. 
Introducing the U.S. CEO of NIO, her name says it all, Padmasri Warrior. Thank you, Leslie. And uh, Kara is not only a badass, she's an overachiever. <laughs> who, who can tell three stories in eight minutes, right? <laughs> only she can. Um, so I think my story is very simple. I uh, grew up in India. I grew up in a very small town in India, in, um, in I would say, a middle-class family. Um, I always was interested in um, math and science. Actually, I wanted to be a physics major and uh, be an astronomer and go out in space. And there was no SpaceX back when I was growing up in the small town. Uh, unfortunately, when I was young, I had very bad asthma. I had very severe asthma. It was so debilitating that I actually had to stay out and miss school for, for about a year and a half. Um, and at the time, I actually thought I would never be able to finish school. Um, it was so bad that um, it sort of was, um, it was very undermining for my self-confidence. Um, and I became very shy as a child. And it was sort of like my math and science that helped me excel. Uh, the reason I tell that story is uh, that I actually, I think, gave me a lot of strength to persevere and never give up. Um, and so I don't know how many of you have asthma or know people who have asthma. When you have an attack, it can be pretty bad. You actually can't breathe. Uh, so I overcame that. You know, long story short, uh, long story short I uh, went to engineering school in India. I went to a school called Indian Institute of Technology in New Delhi. Uh, it's one of the most geeky schools uh, for engineering there is. There were only five women in my class of 250. Uh, my second lesson, you know, my first lesson when I was a child overcoming my illness was to never give up. Uh, and my mom actually taught that. She actually homeschooled me for the first couple of years, uh, made me brought all the lessons home. There was no online education at the time. Books were actually sent home and we had to do work at home and I would turn in my tests. Um, the second lesson I learned was when I was in IIT. Um, so I went to IIT. IIT stands for Indian Institute of Technology. The admission rate is very, very small to, to date. It's uh, very few women in those technical schools. I went thinking I was the smartest person on the planet. Uh, and first day at school, I realized I was not. There's a lot of really, really smart people. And there were, like I was saying, only five women in a class of 250. Uh, so my second lesson was we really stuck together. The five women in my batch, we helped each other out. It was a, a community of five women uh, in a class of 250 that really helped each other out. And so to this day, I feel this community is uh, a community that I owe a lot to. I feel those, my, my friends, my, uh, the women that helped me uh, get to, get through IIT and, and get to belong, feel a sense of belonging is something that I care a lot about. Um, insights, I think we were asked to uh, share insights. Uh, so basically after IIT, I uh, came to the US, I went to graduate school, I started my career as an engineer and uh, worked my way up from a line engineer to become chief technology officer for Motorola semiconductor business, uh, then moved to become Motorola Corporation CTO and then moved to the Silicon Valley about 10 years ago, was chief technology and strategy officer at Cisco left Cisco two years ago, and now I'm the CEO for an electric car company. Um, so, I'm not a mechanical engineer, I've never built cars, but um, luckily for me, cars are now computers, so it makes it a lot easier uh, to build cars. So I'm having a great time, but the reason I tell that story is I've actually changed careers and completely changed industry four or five times in my career. Um, and each time it's been scary, but also super fun. I'm now learning a lot about the car industry and, and how to change the industry and change the technology in the industry. Along the way though, I would say two insights that I'd like to share with all of you. People like to stereotype not just roles, but even functions. Um, in the sense that if you're an engineer, uh, there's a stereotype that says you can't dress up, you can't love fashion, I love fashion. <laughs> Uh, I grew up in a country that loves color. India is a very colorful country. We love jewelry. I grew up in a country that, you know, admires all these things. And I, when I started as an engineer, I sort of felt that I couldn't be who I am. Um, I couldn't wear jewelry. I couldn't dress up. I couldn't wear bright colors. I couldn't make, put makeup on. Because for some reason, if you did all those things, people thought you were not technical or you couldn't be a great engineer. Um, and so 
to me that I wanted to break that stereotype. So I love wearing bright colors and um, I love being who I am. Uh, so my advice is own who you are. Don't hide behind a function or a job. Um, own who you are and let the world see who you are. Um, and I tell all engineers this, that you can truly be who you are. You don't have to wear a hoodie all the time to be a great programmer. <laughs> um, the second stereotype is you can't have a great family and a career. Uh, and I think that's another myth. Um, I have a great family. Uh, my son is now 24. Um, I raised him the whole time I was working. Uh, he's more of a feminist than I am. Uh, very much proud of that fact. He now corrects me on some things that I do, uh, telling me how I'm stereotyping women the wrong way. Uh, so I'm very, very proud of that. Um, so I think you can do both. Uh, it's not the question of having it all or not having it all. There is no perfect world. There's no balance. It's truly integration. You have to prioritize things that are important to you at every stage. At certain stages of my career, I prioritize my family. And certain other times, I prioritize things that have to do with work. Um, I'm a career person, absolutely, I've had a great career, but I'm a homebody. At the end of the day, uh, my safe space is my home. With my friends, I love to cook, I love to eat, um, I love wine, and so wine, food, friends are what I really enjoy most. Um, and I think that is another thing goes back to owning who you are. Uh, my advice, I would say, power itself has different stereotypes. I think there is a particular definition of power that we should all break, right? You know, you can be, people associate uh, if you're decisive as being you're not approachable. And so somehow, sometimes we're in a position of authority. Uh, we think we have to be not approachable, right? We sort of build the shell around us. But in fact, you create a strong followership as a leader if you are approachable. That doesn't mean you're speaking from a, a position of low power. So you have to be really clear as a leader you're powerful, but you're approachable. Um, I think this is a you know oxymoron in some some ways, right? And that, same thing. I'm very results oriented, but that doesn't mean you have to be ruthless. Um, you can get results by coaching people how to get there. You know, you can be an empathetic leader that understands. Sometimes, you know, we are in a business. I'm in a business where competition is intense. We're a startup trying to build cars in in a global world where everything is changing. We are an unknown brand. Um, so results are very important, but that doesn't mean you have to ruin people's lives. Uh, I think this is something that the tech world really underestimates the power of creating a great culture where people can be happy and they contribute results to. So I would encourage all of us as we think about here we are, changing the definition of what power means. Let's change the definition of what power means and make it much more inclusive. Thank you. So it's not very often that you can point to someone and say, this person is changing the world with an impact that is real and that is inspiring. So I'm honored to point to such a woman, introducing the founder and executive director of Black Girls Code, Kimberly Bryant. Thank you very much. Okay, let's see how I'm going to get through this eight minutes. <laughs> so if I, I speak very quickly, I, forgive me. I'll ask you to forgive me in, in advance. Pretty women wonder where my secret lies. I'm not cute or built to fit a fashion model size. But when they start to tell them, they think I'm telling lies. I say it's in the reach of my arms, the span of my hips, the stride in my step, the curl of my lips. I'm a woman, phenomenally phenomenal woman. That's me. Now, the first time I heard this, I was about 16 in the back of the auditorium at a Girl Scout event in my hometown of Memphis, Tennessee. And the person that was standing on the stage like a goddess to me with these words so eloquently leaving her mouth and giving me all the inspiration that I thought could ever need was none other than Oprah. <laughs> <laughs> now, it's an understatement. If you know me, you know that my love for Oprah is unbounded. <laughs> I love me some Oprah. But it all started that day when I was 16 years old and I heard her tell me 
a little black girl in the inner city of Memphis, Tennessee, that I could have these dreams and I could be a pioneer in places that I didn't even know anyone else that looked like me who had gone before. Now, my personal journey as a black woman in the field of STEM, it began on the path that was seemingly devoid of great female icons in science to inspire me as the great Oprah did that day. I grew up in the late 60s and early 70s in an inner city neighborhood in Memphis. And now it's an understatement for me to tell you that it was a long shot for a young woman of color like me. I had never seen an engineer, I didn't know what that was. To choose a career in engineering and decide to put on a hard hat and still toe shoes every day, I like heels. <laughs> but I did. And that journey led me to college at what was surprisingly a peak moment for women in computer science. When I graduated from Vanderbilt University, just a little ways from Memphis, at the end of the 80s, I was one of just a few women in my engineering class and only a sprinkling of black women. Yet this was at a time when nationwide women earned approximately 30% of bachelor's degrees in computer science. Now, since that time, the number has plummeted, literally, literally it has plummeted. Women overall only receive about 12 to 18% of bachelor's degrees in CS, but for women of color like myself, that number falls off the cliff. Black women only receive about 3% of the bachelor's degrees in computer science. Our Latina sisters receive maybe 2%, depending on what you're which study you're looking at. And Native American women receive less than 1%. Now, it's no surprise to those of us in this room how those numbers translate to practice in our industry. Let me share a few of those facts with you. Today, women hold less than 14% of executive officer positions at Fortune 100 companies. We represent less than 1% of funded, and let I say funded, startup founders. We hold at most, at most, 5% of the technical roles at the top firms in our industry. And even in this lucrative field of technology, we continue to make at most 77 cents on the dollar to our male colleagues. Now, as shocking as these numbers are, um, they pale in comparison when you look at the statistics of what women contribute to our society. So let me share a bit of that with you. We women perform 66% of the world's work. 66%. There's only like 51% of us in this world. But we perform 66% of the world's work. We produce 50% of the world's food, and yet we earn only 10% of the world's income, and we only own about one or 2% of the world's property. Now, for me, as a mom raising a little girl, it was these statistics that were a wake-up call for me about six years ago. I always consider myself and describe myself as a nerdy mom, raising a little geeky girl who plays lots of video games. And the only thing she wants to do she's a natural techie, was learn how to build and play these video games that she enjoyed in her spare time. Now, as a black woman who had built my career in this field, where I often felt othered, and many, many times I felt alone, I was determined that that wouldn't happen to my daughter. I wanted to create a better and a more ideal, and maybe, maybe, maybe not now, an easier pathway for my daughter Kai and other girls like her. Because she had chosen a field, a career field, where she was still very much an outlier. Even though she had this unparalleled access to technology, she was still going to be conceived as an other. In a field where, even though we're considered others, um, there's a great delight in women as consumers of technology <laughs> products, and yet, organizations and companies like CES willfully ignore our talents as both creators and leaders in the field. And that's really what I decided to change six years ago when I created Black Girls Code. Our mission is really fundamentally to change the face of technology 
And we do that by introducing girls as young as seven all the way to 17 to the field of technology and giving them the skills and tools to build, to create, and to eventually lead. Our goal is to teach, and it's always been our goal, a big, hairy, audacious goal, is to teach one million girls to code by the year 2040 and to become the de facto Girl Scouts of Technology. Remember, Girl Scouts Connection. <laughs> Now, there are many organizations today that teach kids to code, but we remain one of the only ones that still has the singular and pointed focus on engaging with girls of color. And we started very humble with only six students in a basement in Baby Hunters Point in San Francisco. And we've seen the organization continue to grow and thrive. We now have over 14 chapters across the US and in Johannesburg, South Africa. And we've reached over 6,000 students to date. But the work that we're doing with Black Girls Code is about more than coding. We believe that technology could be a catalyst for transformative social change and that we are confident that if we center both women and girls as leaders in the tech space, they're natural change agents. They will drive innovative solutions to a variety of social issues that will improve the lives of our girls, families, and even the world. But first, we think it's important that tech understands they need us way more than we need them. And if tech is going to truly change the world as we always hear this mantra repeated, then women must be seen and heard as the leaders we are and those we may become. Now, 50 years ago to this point of here we are, I wanna say that we've always been here. 50 plus years ago, there were women mathematicians and scientists who worked at the forefront of the tech revolutions, both in NASA and in Silicon Valley. Some of those names we become icons for the next generation and, and these stories about Katherine Johnson and Dorothy Jackson and Dorothy Vaughn. Yet, there's still countless women who remain unseen and perhaps even forgotten. So today, I want to remind us that we stand on the shoulders of these women. And we must engage in our power that we already have to lift each other up through an intersectional lens of empowerment that spans both race and identity. I don't wanna hear another story. I don't wanna go back to my room, open up Twitter, and hear about another man that did something he wasn't supposed to do. I want to talk about how we as women engage with the power we already have to save ourselves and create a better industry. So if you are a woman who is a VC in this room, that means making sure that female startup founders who come in to pitch to your organization get funded. That means if you are a woman in a CEO executive chair, you ensure your company not only goes out and finds and hires women technical talent, but you ensure there is a career pathway to the top so they blast through this, no, this um, proverbial glass ceiling. That means if you have a platform like this, or you get invited to have a seat at the table, you not only take your seat, you pull up a chair and invite another sister. <laughs> I'm almost finished, so tell me crept up. Now, just two days ago, as I watched our sisters unite collectively in Hollywood, and my beloved Oprah <laughs> sounded this clarion call that change is on the horizon. I cannot help but smile because not only did she talk about these women leaders in that room, she gave the proverbial shout out to those of us sitting right here, leaders and creators, women in the field of technology. So while Oprah rallied this crowd behind the call of time is up, in this room today, I think it's testament to the work that the team at Twitter and Leslie's team has done, that we embrace the phrase that this time is ours. So let today be just the first step of us owning our power as phenomenal women to create the change we want to see in our industry. And so now you understand just why my head's not bowed. We don't shout or jump about or have to talk real loud. And when you see us passing, it ought to make you proud because phenomenally, we are phenomenal women. We are here 
This is who we are. Thank you. I'm sorry. Oh my God, talk to me. Today is. We're going to take this event into the night. Um, we're adding 15 more hours to this event. Uh, and now, a woman who has worked her way up to the top and motivated, mentored, and inspired every step of the way. Introducing corporate SVP and global CISO at Comcast, Myrna Soto. Thank you. Thank you so much. So one quick thing, they try to put time restrictions on us. <laughs> Not gonna work. No, actually, I'm gonna try to get through uh, my slides very quickly. Uh, thank you for having us all here, and boy, do I have some wonderful women I am following. Tough shoes to fill. So um, gr thank you for the introduction. I'm blessed with the fact that I have ascended the corporate ladder in my current organizations and organizations that I've been a part of in the past, uh, but it's come at great effort, and it's come at standing on the shoulders of many others. Uh, my journey has encompass so many different industries. This graphic just kind of gives you a little bit of a preview. And right now I spend all of my time and energy worried about cyber attacks, terroristic attacks, and protecting one of the largest infrastructures in North America. My journey also has come through many different cities, one in particular right here in Las Vegas, Nevada. Las Vegas was a career changing moment for me when I had the opportunity to move from a software development leadership role and was asked to take over the security role for MGM Mirage. That is a longer conversation <laughs> that we will have over cocktails because um, it, uh, it'll keep us here quite, quite late into the day. But as I mentioned, many elements uh, came into play for where I am today. Um, I am a very unconventional technology leader. I did not study engineering or any science until much later in my life. I am a psychology major turned business leader, business leader turned technologist out of sheer necessity for technology, and a technology leader turned into a cyber security expert. I am very proud to also say that I'm one of the first chief information security officers to ever be named to a corporate publicly traded board. Thank you, thank you. And I wasn't done there, I had to get a second board, but that's okay. <laughs> um, but, you know, we talked a little bit already today about challenges along the way and a lot of great advice. And I'm, go I'm not going to repeat because many of us have very similar advice. But one of the challenges that I always experience, and I'm sure many that are in the technology space and women trying to climb that ladder, is that you're always one of very few. I was always reminded I wasn't supposed to be there walk in the room and they're like, what is she doing here? There was an obtuse lack of female mentors. I see that changing quite extensively now. One of the challenges was is that I decided that I was unwilling to compromise my style and approach. I am Hispanic, I talk with my hands, <laughs> raise my voice, everybody thinks you're arguing. No, we're having a passionate discussion. <laughs> And throughout my career, there were more than enough times where I was told, tone it down. Don't have to, it's okay, we hear you. No, you don't, you're not hearing me, listen. So I was, I was unwilling to change my style and approach. Throughout the, my entire journey, we face things like frats and clicks. I put on my slide the game of golf, because the game of golf changed my career. I hated that game. <laughs> I love it today though. I, took up the game of golf on the advice of a mentor, a male mentor, and I resented that advice, did it anyway, and it did open up a lot of avenues for me. And to this day, now I'm a little bit of a golf nut, and it's probably not very healthy for my corporate career. <laughs> but one of the things that we all wanted to talk about was shifting the paradigm. I think that when I think about my career, the paradigm was shift, not that I did anything other than force it, but the paradigm shifted because I'm a psychology major. I'm not a STEM, not an engineer. Yet, I've been able to hold a technology role for the last 28 years. I hate to say that number out loud, because you could do the math and then you figure it out. Um, 
one of the things that CES, not just to call them out, but organizations as a whole need to think about is changing where we look for talent. We mentioned before what the stereotypes are for an engineer, what people are supposed to look like, supposed to study. There's a huge wealth of talent out there that is untapped because you just don't have that title or you just don't have that degree. And I think that that's, a, that's something that's got to change. We need to support more women founders and innovators, which we're doing right here today, which is fantastic. The corporate cultures of organizations need to be seen as an asset. Today, they're often seen as a problem. It's like, oh, yeah, the culture. Let's look at it as an asset. We need to celebrate successes, which is what's beautiful about today, publicize and reinforce. That's where the retweets come into place, <laughs> folks. Uh, my advice is very similar to the advice that's been spoken about earlier today. Seek constant reinvention, embrace constant learning, consistently change the norm. So what? Why do I have to hire a cybersecurity analyst? I have the opportunity to hire a software programmer that could help code more securely, et cetera. Just challenge the norm. Remain uncomfortable. I say this to my mentees. The minute that you are comfortable, I love my job, I love what I do, I do it with my eyes closed, that's a problem. Remain uncomfortable. I always say, set limitless goals. Why are you gonna compromise? I wanna reach this by this time and then I'm done. No, what's next? This whole travel and pursue life experiences, that's my own goal. That, <laughs> you're, you're, you're welcome to take that on, but that's my mantra for the year. One of the things that I think about my mantras and guiding principles that I tell many of my mentees is, enter the room you're not supposed to be in. We've said before, if you get invited and you have a seat at the table, yes, take that seat. I'm a firm believer you gotta enter the room and you gotta demand a seat. Why are you not there? Stop asking for permission. I see this time and time again. May I say something? I'm sorry. What are you sorry? What is your idea? Speak up and disrupt. Disrupt is an absolute requirement. I did a lot of reflection this holiday period and decided that 2018 was gonna be my year of why not? Why not think about changing my job? Why not think about moving to another city? Why not changing a career? More to come on that. <laughs> My mantra is also to work hard and play hardest. Play hard, play hardest. Be the hardest player when you have a chance to unwind. Many women are told not to be arrogant. Don't confuse confidence with arrogance. You can be confident, and who cares if they think you're arrogant, but it's not the same. You can walk confidently and know your skills and know your worth and know what you contribute and not worry about it coming across as arrogance. My favorite, success is the best revenge. <laughs> Early in my career, someone told me I was not gonna be able to do something. And that is the best thing to tell me. Myrna, you can't. I say, watch me. <laughs> success is the best revenge. Don't spend any energy trying to do anything to anyone or to any company or to anything. Focus on your success. It is the best revenge. So advice to my younger self. I thought about this a little bit. And although I say don't compromise, don't this, don't that, I do think that as my younger self, I would have appreciated listening a little bit more. There are a lot of things that just went right by me in my early, early days of my career in my 20s when I thought I knew everything and I didn't. Kara said, someone said, doesn't want to take a risk at 20. You're 20, do what you need to do. I needed to realize that failure was not defeat. Failure just offered an opportunity to learn, to change approach, and to win. Adjust motivators and measures of success. I grew up in a very modest Hispanic family in a very middle class, blue collar community and success was measured by how much you made. And that was a motivator. How much can I make? Now, I wanna know how much can I impact? What will be my legacy? What will happen when I'm gone? And I'm gonna be around for a while, hopefully. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully. Um, the other would be, you know, although change and evolution is very key, I think heritage is also important. If you don't understand why something is, how are you able to change it? 
You need to understand why that's happening. Give yourself time. You know, everyone wants to reach a certain level by a certain time. I did that. I would put numbers out there and say, by the age of X, by the age of Y. I stopped doing that. It's a journey, and things are presented to you that you don't realize is meant for you. And then last but not least, my advice to my younger self, don't change a thing. Next up, a woman who embodies authentic leadership and is a true agent of change. She has always and continues to use her passion, her position, and her power to push women in technology forward. CMO of GE, Linda Ba. So um, it's such a treat being here uh, not just to be talking to all of you in the room and the people on Twitter, but frankly to be listening to all of the women up here. I am wildly taking notes, so I hope all of you are too. I'm so inspired. Um, so look, I followed the rules. I don't know, I follow the rules too often, I think. So I mean, here's my slides. Um, I, uh, I thought I'd start by um, <laughs> telling you a little bit about my story. It's kind of about myself and sort of what I learned about myself along the way. Um, so. Um, I, um, I think part of my story has been sort of this career of perpetual motion. I am so sorry I put the number 30 up there. What the hell was I thinking? But 30 years of, uh, of just mixing it up and doing um, things that um, I found really interesting. So that means I've worked on the IndyCar circuit, never drove, I'm not Danica Patrick, but promoted IndyCars, I've been in magazine publishing, I've worked for financial services, I work for a very big industrial company, I've been on the brand side, I've been on advertising, and I find that absolutely fascinating. So when young people come and advice to my younger self, it's take that interesting job, take the thing you haven't done before. Um, that's been really, um, I guess, a hallmark, something I've loved, embracing the unfamiliar, which a couple of my, you know, former panelists or, or leaders talked about earlier. Um, follow my heart, not my head. So I had a great role model. Um, my dad um, wanted to be a doctor um, from the time he was five years old. Um, he was a physician, is a physician still. He retired at 80. <coughs> Uh, he lasted three months and went back to work. Um, so, um, and he, the advice he always gave me growing up was, Lynn, like, follow your heart. Doesn't matter what you do, just be great at it. And I feel really lucky that I found a company that lets me do that. Um, not just me, but the people I work with. So I'll, t I'll share a really uh, sh very short story, not funny like Kara's were, but you know, <laughs> what have you. Um, we all have our talents. Um, so I was with a group of GE leaders last week, and a, a friend of mine leads our women's health care group. And uh, she won the, one of the big awards last week, like product of the year, an internal award at GE. So her team, a team of all women, redesigned a mammogram. It was a team of women that realized that one in four women don't get mammograms because like it friggin' hurts, <laughs> right? Um, so they went about creating a new mammogram that is that reduces pain, reduces the amount of time that you need to spend doing it. And I was so proud of them. And I just sort of thought to myself, like, that's where I want to be. I want to be at a company, at a place that's thinking that way, that's inventing what's next. Um, I, I truly believe that diversity leads to better results. I mean, Kim had fantastic stats. Um, I don't have fantastic <laughs> stats. Um, but I am convinced in my heart and my soul that diverse teams, diversity of thought, diversity of gender, diversity of points of view make a difference. It's how I've led my team. I mix up my team constantly, probably much to their own chagrin in terms of how we organize ourselves, disruption labs, et cetera. And then, you know, part of my story 
has been um, finding the magic. So kind of my first example of different kinds of roles. I've never sort of climbed that career ladder in a, in a way that would be vertical and traditional. I have had the great pleasure of working for some amazing people, a lot of amazing women. I feel super lucky about that. So to me, it's always the, the visionary leaders. So um, maybe in true form, since I'm not a technologist like some of the others, I was a psych major like Myrna, um, but I'm a marketer. And um, one of the things I've tried really hard to do at GE is to um, uh, help us find a way to get more women in tech roles. It's been incredibly important to me. Um, it makes for a better company. Um, it makes for better work. So I'm going to show you a, like, a really short video, I promise, like it's within my time frame, um, of something that, that we announced earlier this year, which is this idea of how a company, when you're a big company, you can do some things. And um, scale can be an advantage. So we set a really audacious goal and said, we're going to have 20,000 women in technology by 2020 and um, super proud it's a journey it's really hard it's really hard it shouldn't be hard but it's hard we're going to different universities we're finding different kind of talent so the video i'm going to show you really fast um as fast as it'll run is uh is sort of how we introduce this and it's fun i thought you'd like to see it i may have to click it again i'm millie dressel stop happy birthday sweetie Millie Dressel House Day. We are so glad to have you here. What if we treated great female scientists like they were stars? Yes, queen. What if Millie Dressel House, the first woman to win the National Medal of Science and Engineering, were as famous as any celebrity? The Millie Dressel House was seen having lunch today. What if we lived in a world like that? We know a place that's already working on it. Good, right? Thank you. So I have to tell you one very short thing, which is three young women on my team pushed for us to do this. And I'm so proud of them. And I'm kind of proud of myself that I listened to them. Because I think back to the point that Myrna made, like sometimes being a leader is just understanding what you know and what you don't know. And I knew enough that these women had this tremendous passion around this, and they developed this program to the point that um, uh, earlier, earlier this fall, uh, last year, I guess, at this point, we took over the ceiling at Grand Central Station in New York City, and we uh, put the faces of famous women scientists on the ceiling as the unseen stars. And if you know Grand Central, as I imagine many of you do, it is a celestial ceiling. But it was just a different lens. And I think that's what all of us want. That's why we're here. Right, it's sort of showing the world our lens. So I'll end quickly on, on my advice. You've heard a lot of it from others. Um, presume good intent. It is amazing what a difference that makes if you go into something and you presume sort of people are gonna have the right intention. Passion, we've talked about. I think passion trumps it all. Um, getting out of your comfort zone. Um, uh, optimism to me has been sort of a life Blood. I do very well with positive energy. I do very poorly with negative energy. So um, I bring that and I sort of seek others out. Um, you know, CEO of your own career, I mean, the advice I give so many young people is you, you got to take charge, right? Like nobody's going to sit there and say, here's your career plan, so you have to be in charge of it. Um, and then, you know, look, as leaders, your job, I think, my job is you know, take a, a, a little less of the uh, credit and a, and a lot more of the blame. Um, that's the way it should be. And I, I'm ending, I should have chosen Dr. Seuss because I, unlike Kara, love Dr. Seuss. So here she is with Dr. Seuss and I am with Simon Sinek, so you know, whatever. Um, but, but I love this. Um, the role of a leader is not to come up with all the great ideas. The role of a leader is to create an environment in which great ideas can happen. So a thanks to Leslie who's created that environment today for all of us. And so 
So I'm excited to start our chat with an inspiring force who is transforming the future of media and technology. She's 27 years old, and I want to be her when I grow up. <laughs> Morgan DeBaum, co-founder and CEO of Blavity. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. So, I want to start with just how and why you built Blavity. Yeah, so Blavity, for those of you who may not be familiar, is a black media company. So we have five brands, um, Blavity, AfroTech, which is a black tech conference, um, 2190, which is a women's brand, Shadow and Act, Travel Noir, and of course, Blavity. So um, a little bit about me. I'm from St. Louis originally, and I went to Wash U for undergrad, and you know, Wash U is a primarily white institution, um, a PWI what we call a PWI. Oh, much better. <laughs> um, and, but it didn't feel that way. Like, when you went on campus, it felt like an HBCU, a historically black college and university. And it was because there was this really strong foundation and community of black people. And, you know, one of those moments that was critical for me as I was kind of discovering my own blackness um, was the lunch table. So every day, there was this giant table in the middle of the cafeteria. All the tables in the cafeteria were rectangles, and the one in the middle was round. Of course, that's where all the black people sat. <laughs> so we would sit there, and you'd spend hours there. And um, it was really home, because you had seniors, freshmen, Greek, people who were in econ, people who were CS majors, talking about different things. Um, and everyone was welcome, whether you were there every day, even if you didn't have class, or uh, you had graduated, <laughs> and mm. you were still in St. Louis. It was a place where everyone was welcome. And when I graduated college and moved to Mountain View um, to work at Intuit, I was like, oh, where am I? <laughs> How many of you guys have been to Mountain View before? Yeah, yeah and like lived in Mountain View. Yeah. Um, as a 22-year-old black girl, like, it's not popping. Like, it's, yeah. it's not a place you want to be, you know? And, and I had never felt loneliness before. Like, I actually did not know what loneliness felt like. And I was really depressed. Um, and I didn't know what that was. And um, I was you know, finding a lot of different ways to um, communicate and stay connected with the black community from WashU, um, with others that were in the Bay Area. We had group meets, we had group listservs, we had Facebook groups, we had WhatsApps. And it was like, you know, in Silicon Valley words, that's friction, right? That is friction to find, I mean, what we're doing right now as women, this is friction, right? We had to create something new outside of what was already given to us um, so that we could feel part of a community and not feel lonely and feel be, to be seen. And so that's what Blavity is about. It's about reducing that friction. Um, everything we try to do is to solve a problem. So Afrotech, for example, which is now the largest black tech conference. We had 1,700 people in the middle of San Francisco, really aggressive. Mm -hmm. It was like the blackest thing you've ever seen. <laughs> and people were like, you know, there's no black people in tech. <laughs> no, it was sold out three weeks in advance. Um, you know, they said tech companies don't care about hiring. We could, did not have enough space for sponsors, right? Um, you know, black people can't raise money. Well, that's not true. We had tons of founders who had raised millions and millions of dollars there. And so um, for me, Blavity is about creating those spaces and places where um, we, we are where we're supposed to be. Yeah. And to that point, from the journey of when you were just getting started until now, what were your biggest challenges and how did you break through? Um, the biggest challenge, I think, was myself and mindset. I mean, I think a lot of our speakers today have talked about that. Um, for me, I have to ask myself, why not me, frequently? So when, when presented with a problem or when I see something that is that kind of friction moment, it's like, well, who else is better than Blavity or our team to solve that? Um, and sometimes I'm like, well, you know, <laughs> BET, <or> Comcast, <laughs> you know, like people with billions of dollars. Um, and, and oftentimes it's like, yeah, it's probably us, right? We're, we've got the, the higher risk tolerance. Uh, we've got less to lose, uh, more to gain. And so I think as the, the leader of our team, um, I constantly have to remind myself if I'm not dreaming big and thinking large, then why else would my team think bigger than me, yeah. right? And so it's my responsibility to be constantly pushing myself to, to kind of not fit inside the box. Yeah. And when you think about um, millennials, and we, you know, there's an obsession with millennials, and you are one, um, <laughs> what, are we, what are we missing? What are the misconceptions, especially as it relates to women? What should we be thinking about, especially as we're talking about you know, pushing forward into the future? Well, one, I think we're getting older, right? So millennials are now about to have babies and buy houses or not buy houses because of how things are happening. Um, <laughs> you know, right? I live in California, right? So, 
I think for, for millennials today, a lot of us want to be owners. We want to have a piece of the pie. We want to be heard. I, I, uh, when I was working at Intuit, I often felt like, oh my god, I'm going to have to be here for 20 years for someone to <laughs> listen to me. And like, that's not OK. Um, and I think as leaders in the tech community, you know, we need to respect each other and, and not take age as a deficit. You know, oftentimes, that's an opportunity for, for growth and to listen to new perspectives. Yeah. So every woman so far on stage has spoken about their advice, either advice to your even younger self or advice to the industry or advice to women in this room or around the world. Um, what's your advice? Um, it would be similar to what others have said. Don't ask for permission. You know, I definitely, I moved fast in, in what I've been doing, but I think I could have moved faster <laughs> if I wasn't being like, well, let me go see what other people think about this idea, and let me go read on Quora forever and ever, <laughs> and like read every TechCrunch article ever posted about this subject. <laughs> Just do it, yeah. you know, and, um, and learn, because learning and failing, like, that's part of the cycle, and the faster you can get to that, the faster you can make progress. Thank you. Thank you for being the future. Yeah. Thank you for having me. We <laughs>
that can speak in your behalf when you're not in the room and push you in places where you may not have access to, your mentors may not have access to. And for women really being able to ascend in leadership roles, I have found that sponsors were key to that for me when, when I was in corporate America, which I, I never hoped to ever go back to. <laughs> but when I was there, you know, sponsors were key to me being able to move up the ladder because they had that, that seat of power at the time and you need those folks if you want to move into leadership to be able to stand up for you. And it's different than a mentor. Mm -hmm. So I have another question from at Faster Horse. <laughs> I like it. What <laughs> tactics do you use to get your ideas heard in an all-male meeting? That's easy. <laughs> Pound on the desk. Yeah. What did I? I'm sorry. I apologize. I said that's easy. Pound on the desk. <laughs> I, no, I think that, you know, I, I mentioned before that women, and I'm not trying to pick on us, but we are too polite. You know, we, we kind of like, where, is it my turn to talk? Is it, you know, I don't want to overshadow. Command the attention. At the flip side, there, you know, we're also, also burdened with, uh, wow, she really commands the room and doesn't let anybody else talk. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's finding a healthy balance, but look around. I mean, when I'm in a room with my male colleagues, nobody asks for permission mm -hmm. and no one is criticized for expressing themselves and we shouldn't be either. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say know your stuff. I mean, I agree completely yeah. with Myrna, but um, I think it's know your stuff. Have a point of view. And uh, if it isn't being heard, say, you know, I've got something that I've got to contribute. But I, I do think it starts from having something to yeah. contribute. I would add Good to, point. you know, have authority. You know, speak with authority. A lot of times women use other words in between what they're trying to say. It's like just be direct and say what you mean. Yes. Yeah, I would say be the boss. Right. Yeah, that works for me. Right. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I'm serious. No, I'm serious. Everyone doesn't want to be the boss. Like I use my boss to do quite boss. a lot. <laughs> um, and sometimes, you know, when people in a room, they, they everyone feedback like this is what I think, and I'm just like, no. And they're like, why? I said, I'm the boss. <laughs> <laughs> and so I think uh, women do b b go away from being the boss, or when they're the boss, mm -hmm. they're like, hey, what do you want to say? Or, oh, wh you know, not get not that you don't want to get input, but at some point you have to make the decision, and, mm -hmm. and you should own it completely or and direct mm -hmm. it. I think we did a lot of. Uh, I have some great mail letters at, at Recode, but I think we did the Alan. POW coverage that we did, we covered it like the Super Bowl, essentially, mm -hmm. because we thought it was an, I thought it was an important thing, because I was the editor, mm -hmm. and that was why. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And so that's, I think owning power is really, mm -hmm. having power and being in charge is really important. So, so we have an, oh, sorry. To say. No, I, I, I mm -hmm. agree. I think that the most important thing is to make sure when you're making a point, you're speaking with authority and knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, I think if you're just making a point to make a point, people will discount it. So knowing your stuff, I think that's yep. really critical, but then saying it with a, with a sense of authority is important as well. I think it's also, I, I wanna leave us with all the onus that like all of this issue being on women. I think it that's also true. sits with men and it also sits with us as allies to other women that if you see a woman trying to raise her voice in a room that's male dominated and it gets bypassed, then you reflect back, well, no, I think, Kara made this point a while ago. So I think it's also about how we hold space for each other, ensure those women that may not be as comfortable having their voice heard that we back that up. So I, I, I'm always like pushing the envelope of how can we um, change the dynamics for each other in the spaces that we hold. And I think that's just as important as a woman who uh, you know, you know, I just had power. lunch with a male VC, and he said, "I've gone this year. I've gone out of my way because I've noticed women don't give feedback." He suddenly mm -hmm. noticed this, <laughs> um, but it's fine. I was trying to be supportive as I was thinking, "I'm going to fucking hit you in a second. <laughs> but he, um, but he was like, and in meetings now, I've noticed men talk over each other, uh, and I have said, "You know, what about you, Susan, or whatever the whatever the partner's name is?" And he goes, "You know, in like just three months, it's totally changed." And I was like. <laughs> He's probably overwhelmed. <laughs> it, it, was, it was interesting, but I liked that effort. I was like, A for effort. Kind of I want to open up to questions in the room. We have more from Twitter. But if you have a question, right at the front. Hi, my name is Andrea Varnado. Um, and my question for the group is personal, but I hope relevant to everyone in this room. I find that no matter how much success I have or how much I prepare, sometimes when I go for that big push, I still get those butterflies in my stomach. <laughs> so I'm wondering for each of you, 
what's your secret? When you're alone with your thoughts, how do you push yourself to that next level? I love the butterflies. I mean, <laughs> I, I, I mean, I probably, I got them before I came up here. I mean, I, I think what you learn, you know, this just happens over time, is to sort of embrace the, the nervousness or whatever you want to call it and turn it into energy. And uh, you know, I think if you're if you get complacent and you don't have that sense of is this really going to work, I, I think you you go someplace else. So mm -hmm. to me, it's not a bad sign. It's actually something I kind of look for in terms of am I pushing something hard enough? And, so and I, you know, I mentioned before, failure is not you know not defeat. You learn from it. Not one thing, not one speaking engagement, not one job interview, not one thing you do should ever define you. You pick yourself right back up and you continue to move ahead. And I think that's, that's what's driven me and I get butterflies all the time when I get up on these things. Really? Mm -hmm. No. No. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I, you would imagine I eat Uber executives for breakfast, which I do. They're, they're delicious with a little bit of fava beans. And um, but I was, act I was telling my son this because he was nervous about something. He's, he's a shyer kid. My youngest is much shyer than my oldest. And uh, when, I was in high, when I was in school, uh, I guess it was grammar school, I gave a speech for the first time and I had a piece of paper and it shook, did this kind of thing. And I determined that would never happen again. Mm. And so right then and there, I decided to be an egomaniac and think I was great all the time. And it worked beautifully. <laughs> it worked. So egomania. <laughs> egomania is r narcissism. <laughs> Best antidote. Develop it. Yes. <laughs> Not Padma. She's too I humble. Think, I think for me, She's a warrior, uh, though. I think it's natural to feel nervous. You know, I think for anyone who's accomplished many, many things, uh, it, it's not just butterflies when you're starting a new assignment. It may be something you've done many mm -hmm. times before, but you're talking. It could be feedback uh, you're giving to an employee, and you're nervous about how they're going to react. It can be anything, right? It's no different. For me, it's really thinking about where do I want this to end up. Um, so I always try to think about what do I want out of this and what do I want the outcome to be. And then I try to logically, maybe because I'm an engineer, I try to logically think of ways to communicate that will get, get me there or get that person there. Um, you know, I've changed careers many times. I'm now running a car company. And when I took this job, people are like, well, have you ever worked in the car industry? Have you ever built a car? Do you even like cars? Um, <laughs> so it's sort of like, so people ask you that question, right? And so I ask myself that question, but it's not about that. It's really about how you're changing the industry. That's why I'm here. So you have to really think about what is the goal I'm trying to accomplish. It's, you know, whatever you're doing next is just the next step. So for me, what gives me the confidence is to think about why am I here? I'm not here to build cars. I'm here to change an industry. That's why I'm here. So I think that perspective always, I think, helps me. I want to know what Morgan thinks. <laughs> huh? um, oh, I think, Morgan. yeah, I'm a bit different than all of you guys. I actually say, okay, I'm nervous. Why am I nervous? Okay, well, what happens if this happens and this happens? And I go down the pipeline and it's like, okay, does that actually really matter at the end of the day? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And um, usually the answer is like, no. Like, mm. so what if I fall as I walk up these stairs? Like, am I going to be less of a CEO of my company? Mm -hmm. No. <laughs> nope. Right? And so once you awesome. realize that it's just in your head, then you can usually manage it. We have time for one more question from the room. In the back. Um, a, um, We're going to get the mic to you okay. so that everyone can hear. Hi, uh, Morgan Dewan from Terra Sports. You guys gave some incredible advice to your younger selves and to all of us in the room. I'm really curious, as a new mom myself, what would your specific advice be for yourself as you became a new mom? Because holy shit, that changes everything. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry about potty training. Everybody goes to the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> Even the dumbest person ends up there. Ends up being able to go to the bathroom. Don't worry. <laughs> so I have great advice because I went through this a lot. When I became a mom, I was running a factory and I had seven days, 24 hour coverage responsibility. I think the, the biggest lesson learned for me is stop feeling guilty about the decisions you make because I was constantly stressed out because I was guilty about no matter what I did. If I stayed home, I was guilty. I wasn't working. If I worked, I felt guilty. I wasn't with my baby. It's like if otherwise, you know, I tried to work from home and then I was guilty. I wasn't working out. And so it's like you guilt yourself to death. And so my advice is stop feeling guilty. And kids grow up fine. They're all fine. They grow up fine. <laughs> yeah, pick some things and let some others go. 
You know, I mean, I can remember feeling like, oh my God, I didn't bathe the kids every night when their hair was dirty or something stupid, right? Um, I, you just, you, you can't get it all. So pick like the things that are really important. Um, the other thing I would say as less new mom and it's as your, your, your daughter or son grows up is what's always been important to both my kids, they're 22 and 24 now, is that I'm excited about work. And when they know that I love what I'm doing, it's that's like cool. a game changer for them. That's cool. So th that's like just something, not now, can't really communicate that. <laughs> but as it goes on, it's, it's an important one I found. I would say also just give yourself a bit of a break. Like I think one of the panelists mentioned it, like you, maybe it was Patty, like to, that you can have it all, but you just can't have it all at the same time. <laughs> Right, and so you think about it, you have 18 years, my daughter's about to be 19, so 19 <laughs> to 21 years of guiding this, this little person until they can become independent. And that means that you know, this path that you're on now is gonna change, but it's a journey. So giving you, yourself that space to understand that you may have to pocket some things to balance what you know, your, your, feeling, your, your path as a mom versus your path in your career, and that's okay, you will get there, you have time. And just take it at, at that slow pace and journey it and, and give yourself a break. Can I take back the potty thing for a second? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I still agree, that's gold. But, um, <laughs> but one of the things that I was thinking about, I was talking to my son who was 12 uh, on the phone the other night, and teach them to be difficult and question things. I was talking about, I was like, what'd you think of the, Ban the book about Ban you know, the, the Michael Wolf book? We were ta we t he talks about politics a lot, he's really interested. And he go I go, what do you think about the Bannon book? I mean, look at all the mess in the White House that I was going on. And he goes, he goes, Mom, it's just a distraction. He's actually making appointments across the country in judgeships, so we should really be paying attention to that. And I don't know why wow. you're focused on that. <laughs> and I was like, you're right, but my God, what a shit show it is in the White House. <laughs> And he's like, Mom, really, try to focus. And I was like, it's a distraction. I was like, oh, I've raised you perfectly. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, I am deeply grateful to each and every one Thank of you. you. Leslie. Yes. Leslie. Yes. Leslie. Yes. Leslie, it's about some horrible thing. Like something happened on Twitter, and I gotta say that she organized this in the middle of so much controversy and everything else that goes on every day there. I, I, I've got to give you. it to you, Leslie. Well done. Thank well you, Kara. Thank you. Thank you, all of you. Thank you. All of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.